This is AP Biology Chapter 9. This is the first of several videos for the chapter on inheritance or genetics. We're going to be looking at a general introduction to what is genetics, how did we discover inheritance, and how does it actually operate at the most basic level. If we were to talk about genetics or inheritance, we have to go back several generations in time and realize that genetics has ancient roots. The science of heredity goes back to literally the oldest attempts of selective breeding, um, but modern genetics as we know it, the genetics that includes DNA, um, even though DNA was discovered until 1950s, is actually given credit to Gregor Mendel, and he was an Austrian monk who kind of demonstrated or did experiments that proved the inheritance pattern back in the 1860s. One of the big things about the ancient attempts at selective breeding is that we were able to figure out how to take one organism and by selecting or breeding or looking for specific traits, we were able to change the way an organism looked over time. Some of the best documented attempts of selective breeding that are what started ancient kind of ancient heredity or genetics, if you will, were farmers doing things with wild mustard plants. If we were to look at a wild mustard plant and take the wild mustard plant and we were to selectively breed for plants that had large leaves, what we would end up with is plants that have, or a plant that is now commonly known as kale. If we were to take the same wild mustard plant and we were to selectively breed it to have very short node length, which means the stems that connect everything are very, very close together, you could actually produce a Brussels sprout. If you were to do the same thing, but this time prevent flowers from forming, then you get cauliflower or broccoli. And so by taking a wild mustard and selectively selecting for certain traits, we were able to produce or artificially select for a wide variety of, um, of different types of crops. Now, moving on with this idea of what Gregor Mendel did, he was looking at traits in pea plants. And what he was doing is he said, I want to know what happens if I cross-pollinate. Because the way pea plants normally operate is a pea plant fertilizes itself. So purple plants make more purple plants, white plants make more white plants, tall plants make more tall plants, and so on and so on. But what he wanted to do was he wanted to say, okay, how do I go about doing this if I want to make a purple plant and a white plant cross? So what he did was he very carefully went into the flower's reproductive parts. And he cut away the anthers, which is what contains the sperm or the pollen. And he would take that sperm and anther from one plant, and he would use a paintbrush and put it on the stigma of the female reproductive starts of another plant. So he was cross-pollinating. The reason why this was important is because it's not what would normally happen in a plant. And after he cross-pollinated, he looked at the results. So what he chose to do was he tested purple and white flowers. He chose to look at plants that produce flowers on the side versus flowers at the top. He cross-pollinated those. He wanted to cross-pollinate yellow versus green seeds, and he wanted to see what would happen. Now, we're going to use for our example from this point on, we're going to be looking at the purple and white flower cross-pollination. And what happened when he took the anthers from the purple flower and he crossed it onto the style of the white plant was all of the offspring. And when we say the F1 generation, what we're really saying is all of the offspring of these two parents came out purple. But what happened was he let all of these purple plants self-fertilize. So purple should make more purple and on and on. But what happened is every time the grandchildren, so this is the grandkids of the original parent, would come out one, two, three purple and one white. Why did that happen? That was the foundation of the genetics or of inheritance. And so if we look at this more closely, what we'll find is that this pattern happened again and again and again. So when he crossed purple and white, three to one, three purple, one white. When he crossed, we can look at all of them, when he crossed axial and terminal, there was three axial and one terminal in the grandchildren. When we looked at the grandchildren, this is the grandkids' results. When we look at the grandchildren, we're going to see that there was three yellow and one green. 
three round and one wrinkle, three blown up pod shapes and one constricted pod shape. It kept happening over and over and over again. And so Mendel said, I gotta find a way to explain this. And it turns on that what he did was brilliant. Mendel described this law as the law of segregation. And what the law of segregation says is that an organism has two genes or two alleles for every trait. What does that mean? Well, if you have two genes for every trait, then if you have two parents, we can logic or reason that for every organism's two alleles, one came from each parent. Now, if we look back at our parents in our original experiment, we would find that one parent was purple, one parent was white. And so in the offspring here, what does this offspring have? It has a purple allele and a white allele, but it only looks purple. This will become more important as we talk about dominant recessive alleles. However, this organism has two different alleles, therefore it's possible to produce two different offspring. It could produce purple offspring, and it can produce white offspring, as we saw in the grandkids. This explains how come one trait showed up in the children, but two traits were possible in the grandchildren. <clears throat> now, if we wipe away and look at what does this law of segregation mean, if we look at the bigger picture, what we can do is start talking about these alleles. <clears throat> An allele is a version of a gene. And it's what accounts for the variations in our inherited characteristics. So for example, whether you are purple or you are white. With that being said, every person inherits two alleles. If you inherit two alleles, one from your mom, one from your dad, then there's two possible combinations. We're looking here again at our results. So the alleles we had were purple and, I'm gonna draw a little P for the white. This offspring has a purple and a white allele, much like we are showing right here in this drawing. There's a purple and there's the white. Then what happens is for this one offspring, let's look back at our offspring, what did we have? Our offspring, our purple and our white, what did it look like? It only looked purple. What does that mean? Well, this goes back to Darwin's law of dominance. And what dominance is, is that if you have two different alleles, the one that shows up, the one that you look like, is going to become your dominant allele. So in the case of our pea plants, the purple flower color was dominant, which then made the white flower color recessive because it didn't show up in the first generation of plants. <clears throat> in order to understand why the white or recessive allele showed up in the grandchildren, we have to understand meiosis. This goes to our law of segregation. The law of segregation says you have two alleles. And of those two alleles, when you go to make an offspring, you go to produce sperm or egg, you're only going to donate one of them. Which one you donate is completely random. Therefore, the offspring that you create will look different. Here we are looking at Mendel's law of segregation in the structure of meiosis. So here we have the parents this is purple, big P, big P, because remember, dominant alleles always have capital letters. This is our white mom. She has two lowercase p's. So dad can only give a big P. Mom can only give a little P, because that's the only two they have. And all of the offspring are going to have one big P, one little P. However, the big P means that it's going to be what color? Purple. 
However, this purple plant, when it reproduces, it could give away a big pea or it could give away a little pea. And so which one it gives away is completely random. In order to understand this, how this can happen, we need to use a Punnett square. And so the Punnett square is going to be used to calculate what are the odds that it would give away a big P, what are the odds that it would give away a lowercase p. And so here we have our Punnett square, our Punnett square for one trait. So the, the parent can give away a big P or it can give away a little P. And because it's pollinating with itself, it acts as both the mom and the dad. Big P. So what if the mom and the dad both gave away their big peas? This offspring would look purple. What if the mom gave away a little pea and the dad gave away a big pea? This offspring would look purple. What if mom gave away a big pea and the dad gave away the little pea? This offspring would also look purple. Why? Because it has the big P in it. But what if mom gave away a little P and dad gave away a little P? Then it would look white. So out of these four boxes, when we look at it, we're going to go one is purple, two is purple, three is purple, and there's one white. So in our offspring that was heterozygous, so it had a big P and a little P, what we find is that in making its children, there is a 75 or 3 out of 4 chance it's going to be dominant. And there is a 1 out of 4 chance it will look recessive. That is because of how meiosis works. This is the end of our first video, kind of our general introduction. We'll continue with more specifics in video 2.